Sunday of the blessed month of Nisra. And this is the last full Coptic month of the year. And we speak of the end times. And this is going to be a gospel that's kind of repeated for next week as well. Uh, next week, we're going to read from Matthew chapter 24. Today was from Mark chapter 13. And we should hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when he says, Be watchful. In the gospel according to St. Matthew for next week, he says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you did not expect. In today's gospel, he says, Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going into a far country who, is, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And I say to you all, watch. And again, in, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 12, he says again, Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come to the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you did not expect. The Lord reminds us over and over and over that we are to remain watchful, to remain vigilant over our souls, over our spiritual lives. Because who we are carrying in our souls is a very precious treasure. Who we are carrying is the Holy Spirit. We have become temples of the Holy Spirit through baptism. And we are reminded that none of us knows when we will meet the Lord. So we need to prepare to meet the Lord on a daily, daily basis. Our fathers of the church spent volumes writing about this subject of watchfulness. And then we hear the words of the Holy Apostle St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 16. He basically summarizes everything our Lord says in one beautiful verse. He says, Brethren, be watchful. Stand firm in your faith, be courageous, and be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. It's a beautiful summary of everything that we were talking about. We as Christians must not be distracted by this world in which we live. We are called to a life of prayer and a life of watchfulness. And that if we practice this lifestyle, we find that we develop a habit. It becomes part of our nature. It's not forced. So that's the good news. It may not be easy at first, but with God's help, with God's grace, we can grow and mature in our spiritual lives. Again, I'm going to echo this verse from St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He says, again, brethren, be watchful. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous and be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. So after telling us to be watchful, St. Paul commands us to be firm in our faith, to be courageous, and to be strong. We are reminded that at the time of St. Paul's preaching, he was preaching in Rome, in the Roman Empire. And this empire did not have the freedom of religion that we take for granted. They didn't have the freedom of religious expression. He was reminding the people that part of being a Christian is refusing to give in to any pressures, either internal or external. Refusing to compromise our Christian faith or our way of life for anything. For anything. Even the fear of punishment to death. Being a Christian means that we have to be prepared to die for our faith. Being a Christian means holding on to your faith as sacred and precious, not compromising those beliefs for any convenience. 
any kind of wealth, any kind of comfort or popularity or some political idea. No, nothing comes before Christ. Nothing. If you put anything before Christ and his teachings, then we become like the Israelites who create a golden idol and start to worship it. But we are his children, and he was crucified for our salvation. And in every generation, there have been precious followers of Christ who have suffered and died for the faith. And this is the witness of the martyrs the church reminds us of as we think about the Holy Night Ruse, the, the Coptic New Year, the end times, all these themes are coming together. Their heroic deeds. Again, St. Paul says, Brethren, be watchful, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, and be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. So after telling the Corinth church to be watchful, to be courageous, to be strong, he gives them a reminder of one of the most important aspects of the Christian life. He writes, let all that you do be done in love. Those are very powerful words to live by. What does love look like? First and foremost, love looks like our Lord Jesus Christ on the wood of the cross. I've heard it said from a, a couple's uh, premarital training that I went through that when we ask a couple in premarital counseling, we ask them, what does love look like? And we hear kind of different responses. Ultimately, we have to point to our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the definition of love in any household. That is the picture of God's love, which means it is a perfect and complete picture, and it's not lacking. Love suffers and is sacrificed on behalf of others. It's not selfish. In a time and an age when everyone wants to compete and win, sometimes love looks like losing. For instance, when a husband and wife are fighting against each other, and one person always wins the argument. They feel like they're winning, but actually they're losing in the end. They appear to win, but they lose because there was no love in the interaction. There was no humility. There was no understanding. It's the same with our interactions with others. Sometimes love compels us to be silent and to let things go instead of causing a confrontation, this insistence on winning arguments, on being right. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. St. Ambrose writes about this when he, in the life of the church when he says, where there is strife and dissension, there is no love. It sounds like this could apply to our own country and our own time today. But it's time for us to rise above the earthly discourse of power, this culture that always seeks after power, and we have to rise above the noise. We serve the society around us and the culture around us by living godly lives, sanctified lives, not by arguing with others or with people online, with coworkers and things like that. Our Lord taught us his, his disciples saying, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and you also love one another. By this, all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. It's simple. The Lord Jesus Christ is like the good teacher who gives us the answers to the final exam so that we might prepare properly for the exam. There's no pop quizzes. He tells us to pay attention because everything that he's telling us will be on the exam. We learn that, in fact, there will be an exam. And that's uncomfortable for some people to listen to. 
that we will be judged. We learn that there are important life and death issues according to which we will be judged, not maybe. In our culture, to speak of judgment seems harsh. But this is the reality of Scripture. There is judgment because God is a judge. No amount of theological um, articulation can remove God from his place as the judge. God alone judges and declares the righteous, and his judgments are true and just. One of the most deceptive aspects of our culture and our society is a belief that when we die, we become nothing. We cease to exist. But we as Christians understand the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as truth and the reality of life. We test everything that we hear and we, that we see and that we understand against the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Christ tells us that when we die, we will not simply cease to exist. That we will not simply vanish. But on the other side of the coin, even among our, our brethren from different denominations, we see the belief that when we die, all will be okay. That if we have just believed in Christ, that we will be saved. That we will avoid judgment and that God will not even judge us. These are very polarizing, opposing beliefs. And ultimately, they undermine the truth of the gospel. The truth as spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ is that God is judge. That there is indeed a judgment. And that each one of us will be judged. And we will be separated. Some will be numbered among the righteous and some will be numbered among the unrighteous. Okay, so what are the criteria of this judgment? How will God judge each one of us? He will judge us based on our actions. Not only based on what we say or what we believe, but on our actions themselves. Simply put, the criteria for a whole and complete Christian life is how well do we love? How well do we love? Our Lord Jesus Christ tells us that at the judgment, each and every one of us will stand and have to give an account for our actions. What actions? Specifically, did we feed the hungry? Did we give drink to the thirsty? Did we welcome strangers? Did we clothe those who are, who are lacking clothes? Did we visit the sick? Did we come to those who are in prison? Our spiritual life and our death are based in part on our actions. And those actions are determined by whether we know and are growing towards God. If we know God, we will know a life towards, uh, of love towards one another. It's not enough to say that we do the things that we are mentioning in the Gospels every once in a while, whenever it's convenient. It assumes that we busy ourselves with acts of love. That we have no time for the works of darkness. We have to avoid living a sinful life. We have to avoid judging others. <clears throat> we have a judge. We don't, we don't take that responsibility of God. We have to avoid speaking ill of others, acting uncharitable, unloving to those who are around us, even to those who disagree with us. We are not called to judge our brothers and sisters in Christ, but to humbly try to reconcile and love them. 
We have to love everyone, the poor, the sick, the naked, the prisoners. But not only that, we have to go further. We have to love those whom we regard as our enemies because God will judge us and we cannot avoid this judgment. One of the saints said, whoever will not love his enemies cannot know the Lord and the sweetness of the Holy Spirit. So the church is calling us, it's a time for refocus, to refocus our lives. At the end of the year, <clears throat> it's a time we, 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 we remember the end times twice, intentionally, two Sundays back to back. It's a reminder for us to come to the Lord, to come back to life. Don't think that we can just be comfortable with a little bit of extra fasting and prayer here and there and call it a day. No, it doesn't work like that. God requires his children to show acts of mercy and kindness to everyone all the time. If his children do not show love, they will be unrecognizable to him. And he will be unrecognizable to us. In the end, we will be not judged by how well we fast. Sometimes this message gets lost in the Coptic church. We will not be judged on how well we fast. Or how well we do prostrations, matanya. Or how often we come to church. We are reminded of the Pharisee and the publican who did all those things. In fact, they excelled at them. But his offering was not accepted by God. Our Lord says to us that unless our righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, we will not be saved. So how does one's righteousness exceed that of the Pharisee? He must do more than believe in God and practice these rituals. His heart must be transformed. He must become humble. He must be broken and refashioned in the likeness of Christ. Today, our Lord tells us what's expected of his kids, each one of us. Out of love and mercy for each one of us, he tells us the truth. So what is the truth? How will each one of us be judged? We will be judged according to, will we be judged according to our feelings? According to our strong opinions? No. Will we be judged according to our words about God? No. We will be judged according to our actions, which are response to our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. St. James in the, in the second chapter of this epistle, he writes, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and be filled but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, it does not have works, is dead. If someone will say, you have faith and I have works, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. <clears throat> St. James tells us that it's not enough to simply believe in God and His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Even the demons believe and they tremble. The demons do not worship God and serve Him. That's the difference. They do not offer up their lives as a living sacrifice to God. We are called to be different. Faith in Christ means living a life in Christ. That is Orthodox Christianity. It's not merely words about Christ. It's life-changing. It leads to a changed view of the world and ourselves. And so, in conclusion, 
We all want to have joyful lives. We all want to have lives that are pleasing to Christ and offer meaning and have fulfillment in life. This is only possible if the one who created us also accepts us to dwell with him in peace and joy for all eternity. Our Lord Jesus tells us that this is possible only through acts of love and mercy. We can only stand at the Lord's right hand if we are willing to live sacrificial lives and go out of our way to show acts of mercy and love to others. This is what expected of us because this is what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for each one of us. He has fed us both with food as well as heavenly bread. He has clothed us with clothing but with garments of righteousness. He has visited us in our sickness and give us, given us both physical and spiritual healing. He has not only visited us while we are imprisoned in our sins, but he has completely freed us from the power of sin and death. So let us be children, his children, and reflect this mercy and love in all of our dealings with other people. May our Lord judge us worthy to be numbered among his faithful sheep. May we live firmly in our faith in this spirit of generosity and compassion as the children of one who is the source of all good things. And may God give us the grace to do so. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Blessed are they.